worked as an MBA in finance, and now has turned his lifelong love into fishing. He's a birder, he's a hiker, he's a traveler, an explorer of the outdoors. Um, in 221, he was here and, by skin, and had a standing ovation. <laughs> and uh, we invited him back again. And now he's going to talk about fishing on the canal. Our second uh, presentation is August 15th, and that's going to be by an architect on a brief history of architecture as it relates to art, food, and culture. Um, August 22nd is Melissa Ferretti, who's a Wap chairman of the Wapano tribe, and she's going to talk about her and Wapano culture, history, and place based knowledge. And last but not least is Cheryl Fay, who's returning for the third time with us, and she's going to do a one woman show on Amelia Earhart. Okay? That's the roster. I'm no brothers. I want to thank Kathy and everybody on the committee that chooses speakers for asking me to come back and give a different topic, but this is fabulous. Um, I want to thank everybody who has showed up. There are a few people here that will make sure that I don't make any mistakes <laughs> because they outfish me some days. Some days. Uh, but, so with my, I will uh, say thank you to my wife Tina. She's going to be doing the slides, and she also will remind me of about 35 minutes in and it's time to start wrapping this up. <laughs> so, without further ado, fishing the Cape Cod Canal. All right, why are we here tonight? Curious about why many cars are parked along the canal. You've seen them and when you have ridden by, there's a lot of cars, but they're not there every day. Mega striped bass fisherman. You know somebody who's addicted to canal fishing and want to know why? You. <laughs> <laughs> some people are here to learn some of the basics. Other people, like Tim are here, because he wants to take every opportunity to improve. And um, also because we appreciate the beauty of the Cape Cod Canal. I have some. I'm astounded every day. I could go without fishing. I, there are just so many beautiful sights, whether it be fog, whether it be birds, whether it be animals, whether it's fish. We see some amazing stuff each and every day while well, most people are still sleeping. Next. All right. Now, uh, this is a sunrise on Cape Cod Canal. Uh, I get the flowers in the background. I learned that from John Doble, a great photographer, that what you need to do is sometimes you have to lie down to take a picture so you get the right foreground. And I wanted these flowers to be along with the rest of the, of the, uh, the picture. That's what we see. All right, I live three miles from the railroad bridge. It takes me six minutes to get there. Um, but I fish the surf. I've been from Portland, Maine, from Wesley, Rhode Island, so I'm, I'm new to canal guy. I only started fishing the canal. Oh, I fished the canal off and on since 2000, but when I moved here 10 years ago, I really started fishing the canal, but I'm really a surf guy. Um, I have 5 a.m. friends. You know, I refer to people as my 5 a.m. These are the people that I see on or about 5 a.m. most days. And then there's another little subgroup, the Boys of Summer. Those are guys I see even earlier, and I probably fish with a little bit more often. But that's how I differentiate. But my 5 a.m. friends. All right, let's go. I've caught a lot of fish. I've caught a very nice canal bass, about 45 pounds one day. <coughs> that fish happened to be 21 years old. I, I, I'm a part of the Sports Fishing Angler Data Collection team. That's S-A-D-C-T. I take about every third striped bass, I take, I measure it, and I take five scale samples, I send them to uh, Kimberly Fine at the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries, and just like tree rings, scales can be aged. So the, the majority of big fish, and a big fish would be somewhere over 40 inches, 45, those fish are about let's say 15 years old, 14 years old, 13 years old. This girl was the oldest I've ever caught, 21, the oldest I've ever seen. 
21 years. That's an old, that fish has been up and down the East Coast a lot. All right. I revive and release all but a few bass annually. If I injure one and I have to take it, I'll take it. But I'm pretty much catch and release kind of guy. Next. Not often do I have a camera with me when I, or I'm with somebody, but my friend Kim and I both caught nice fish simultaneously, so there was a camera out, so we took pictures. I'll show one thing. I don't take them out of the water often. I don't hang them by their jaw and let all the weight go. I support in the midsection. It's an important thing because the organs don't want, don't like to be moved too much. All right. Um, I was past president of Asteroid Pass. You learn a lot of, lot of things from these people in these clubs. I'm a member of Falmouth Fishermen's Association, Buzz of Bay Anglers, Stan Gibbs. The club doesn't exist anymore, but the Stan Gibbs guys are out there fishing and talking all the time. Uh, benefits of club members, membership. Fisher members, listen to speakers, talk fishing. Uh, volunteer. So all these clubs have the vets. If you volunteer, what you do is you get into what's called the in crowd, or you get into the click. And those are the people who share a lot more information. When you're putting in some time, putting together a show or an event, you get invited to go certain places. You get told certain techniques. It, that's stuff that takes time to learn. Well, you ramp up by joining and volunteering and helping. But it's that way with any club. So be a, be a member of any club, volunteer, join, you'll learn a lot, and it's good. Next, keep it wet for release. So the whole thing the state's been doing, because the striped bass is becoming endangered. Um, that fish is still in the water. It's on the edge of the canal. I still have to reach down, uh, use some fish grips, hold the lip a little bit, use my pliers, take the hook out, let that girl out without getting me even out of the water. Uh, there's a mortality rate involved. You, want, you can cut the mortality rate on catch and release by keeping them, keeping them in the water and doing it quickly. All right, I told you there's some beauty in the canal. That's one day at 7 a.m. Doesn't get much prettier than that. Next. Uh, this was sunrise in 2023. And, uh, I had a series of, I was going to do a coffee table book called, uh, It's 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> but it's 5 a.m. And because we see a lot of stuff at 5 a.m. All right, the canal. Completed in 1914, widened and deepened in 35. It's a highway. Half, about 60% of the fish go from Buzzards Bay to Cape Cod Bay and keep going right through the canal and about 35% go around uh, by Provincetown and the Outer Cape beaches. So we get a lot of fish that come through. Um, current changes direction four times a day. That's important, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Every day you have a chance to catch a 40-pound striker. Not that you will, but it's one of the few places where you can be standing and you can cast into 35 feet of cold water which the fish like cold water. So you really have a good shot because of the current and the depth. Uh, the land cut. People talk about the canal. People say, how long is the Cape Cod Canal? The real techies will say it's 14 miles. Other people will say, well, there's a land cut of seven miles, but it continues out well into Buzzards Bay and a little bit into Cape Cod Bay. And the canal itself, is maintained for depth for 14 months. Next. That's what the canal looks like. It's not a straight line. Uh, it's that, when they designed it, that's to slow down the water in the bends as the tides rush through. Uh, also, and I just had this discussion with Todd the other day, we were talking about why some places are better for fishing than others. The bends. Where there's been, the, 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 where, the, where the current bends, the fish may, or the bait fish may be forced a little closer to shore in that location, or they may, a rib may form. Lots of things that affect how and why you can catch a fish. So the curves make a difference. 
On the water, again, this is stuff you can Google. Cape Cod Canal, these fishing spots, all these spots have, spots have names. I mean, to some guys, I'll say, well, I was at Dick's Rick, which is over here. Or I was fishing over at the, the tidal fans or the railroad bridge. Every, a lot of places have different names. Midway Gate, but Mass Maritime. And one other thing you have to learn is where to park and not get a ticket. But there are lots of places. And if you're a born resident and you have a born beach stick, you can park at the campgrounds for free. And that's a good thing to know because that sort of really helps give you access to the other side. Because some of those places, the parking doesn't open until 6 a.m. And the fact of the matter is, we're not 5 a.m. friends for nothing. We're actually taking it at 5 because you're, 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 you're there before 5. All right, so there's the canal we can look at. Now, Tina to help me, I wrote, drew this chart several years ago for, another, for a presentation. And, and she really darkened it up quite nicely with a lot of fancy artwork. But um, this is what the canal looks like in cross section. Not the scale, but the fact that there's an access road down each side. The bridge abutments are 480 feet apart. And that's really, there are some parts of the canal that are slightly narrower, and, and there are a lot of places that, that are much wider, especially down toward the east end. Um, but that's how the <coughs> it is. And there are people who, in theory, can cast all the way across. All right, now, there's rocks. There's an edge. A lot of times you can actually, when the tide's out, you can stand here and fish. Other times that when you're standing on the edge, the next thing you get to is five or ten feet straight down. You don't want to fall in there. Uh, there's weed along the edge. There's boulders. There are holes. What I don't have, there's a muscle bed right in here. And you catch people's line and it's caught on the muscle beds. It, but, the fish hide and live in these holes. So think of these not just in the cross section, but they're, some of them are big, some of them are holes big enough for a fish to sit in. And they'll let the current flow over and then they'll wait and open their mouth and grab what's coming by. Uh, so uh, that's what it looks like in cross section. When we fish it, we'll cast across and then the current will take the thing down and you're basically you start out bouncing it over here, and then you keep bouncing it, and then you get over here. And some days, that's where the fish are biting, right along that edge. But then one, some days, you say, well, I'm going to bounce it one more time. And then you get caught up in the stuff, and that's when you donate a lure to the fish guns. <laughs> it just happens. But, it's invariable. There are days that the fish are hitting on the very last bounce when you're bouncing the jig. When you're fishing surface floors or swimmers or other types of lures, a lot of times they'll actually still be in on this edge, but you don't have to worry about losing your lure on the bottom. But even though you have 480 feet to catch fish, you're catching fish 15 feet from shore. All right, next. All right. The east end of the canal has, has, is a, is the sandwich tide is about nine feet. So I'm actually, this is last week, I'm standing here for this picture. And about an hour later, this water here had actually all gone out. I'm standing out over here and all this water is gone. But that water, so I'm five, eight hundred feet. So four feet above, four, four feet up my, above my head is that edge. I, I, at high tide, I'd be standing in four feet of water over my head there. Uh, but there's also bubbles. Go back for one second. The reason why we, when, why, when I'll talk about equipment, this is all bubble weed. It's rock, this rock's a slick. It, it's not the safest place to fish, but there are places that you put your time in, you can find places to stand that are much easier. Other times you have to sit down, scoop arm on your butt to get down low to get to where you want to be. But that's what it looks like. Okay, next. 
equipment. It can be an inexpensive sport or a very expensive sport. A rod is 10, 11, or 12 feet long to throw it along the big lures a long way. 80 to 800 dollars. And this this lies a couple of years old, so they're probably be more than 800. Reels, 5,000, certain size reels. 80 to 800 dollars. Line, $40, $50 to spool up. You tie your own leaders, but you have to buy $30 worth of leader material to cut to tie your leaders. Always have a tape measure. It's nice to measure your fish periodically. I don't hang them in the way of them, I don't measure them. Uh, and incidental, swivels, clips, lures, plastic fish grip. I have one that's a courtesy of East End Eddie. Uh, pliers, canal tie table. This is, and I'll talk a little bit later, this is the Bible. It tells you lots about the canal. Um, nail clippers, I use them to cut my line. Bug wipes, um, a hat, a light for night fishing, and a log book. Um, I actually have some other slides in it. Pretty much I, I plan, I know, I write the tides for a week in advance, what, where they're going to be, make a plan. Then when I get back home that day and after my nap, I will write down what happened that day. The number of fish, maybe what lures hit, what time it was, stuff like that. So every fisherman I know has a log. All right, next. Canal mic. You don't need a canal mic. My first three years fishing the canal seriously down here, I just would pick a place where I was going to fish and go there and fish, and I would fish the tide there without moving around. So there's a place called 100 Steps. Um, it's more than 100 steps. Well, it's 88 steps, but the steps aren't the whole way. It's, you're going through paths in the woods, but it's on the Mainly inside of the canal, one of those big rest areas, you can park there and you can walk down and get to pole number 240, which is one of the poles in the canal. But it's a walk down, and back in the day, when there were people who were catching serious fish and taking them off, then they would catch a nice fish and they'd be down there at, at, at the bottom of the 100 steps, not have a bite, and have to hike that 30 pound bass up the hill. Not me. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a Striker Conservation license plate. SC, Striker Conservation 701. It's my birthday. So I figure once I start losing my memory, I'll either, I'll either know my license plate or my birthday. <laughs> uh, but there's the canal bike. I've got multiple poles, two poles there. I can't have a third one when the Albies might be in the canal, and I might, might be wanting to throw something a little bit lighter, I'll, I'll carry a third row. One of the most important things is right here. A ski stick, a ski pole, and take the little stuff off the bottom. When I'm walking down the rocks, I'll hold my, my rods in these hands, and I will always have that pole, and I will always make sure that that is wedge somewhere or right on the rock and not put so that when I'm stepping down, remember how what we need that look, uh, it's like this, it's moving. You don't want to fall. Uh, that's, and then as I, in these baskets here I carry a couple of lures. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, next. Then some people have electric bikes, and some have electric tricycles. <laughs> I'm not saying names, but that's an electric trike, a couple of rods, lots of gear, all the good stuff. All right, a few lures, and, and, and I'll mention when I talk about lures, but this will give you the basic thing. That's a, that's a pencil pump. You work that on the surface. <coughs> this is a stick chat or something else that I'll swim. This is what I would call paddle tail lures, a lure, uh, a jig head, 
with a big rubber tail, which tails are interchangeable. When bluefish come, they like to eat it from right here under the hook, <laughs> over there. Uh, and it's uncanny how they can ch chop it off right there <laughs> most times. All right, and then there's the magic swimmer. And it's named magic swimmer because it works like magic. And it was huge 10 years, 8 years ago, everybody was catching fish on them. And to tell you the truth, last couple of weeks, it's been one of my go-to lures. Just, it, it recycled. Um, this is a loaded cork and cordell popper. So this was a hollow pencil popper, and this is filled with buckshot or a lead shot. So it weighs about four ounces and it sinks. And I bounce this on the bottom or I fish the whole water column. So because the fish can be anywhere from the bottom to the top or somewhere in that 35 to 50 feet in between. And then this is sort of the new, one of the newer style lures. They're wider at the, at the end. They might have a little extra weight here. And they, they, they are for casting to the middle. Not that you always have to cast to the middle, but sometimes that's where the fish break. So those are the some basic lures. Next, jigs, three to five ounces, paddle tails. All these people make different paddle tails. Savage, gags, bill hurl. The newer ones with this fish lab and plus canal bait and tackle has their knockoff. And it's really, it's much more integrated with the, with the head of the lure. In, in the tail. It just pre presents, it's a nice tight presentation. And they cast a little bit better because they're not quite as floppy. Uh, and then loaded pencils. Okay. Um, new lure types. Made for distance. See how it's, it's like when Tiger Woods started playing, going, came on the golf scene, and everybody started hitting the ball past the John Daly distance. Well, the technology has changed, so all of a sudden people have better rods, better lures, and they want to throw it further. And you know, people say, oh, look at that, way that guy casts. Um, PKs, happy as a clam, custom, people make their own. Um, heavy plastic versus loading. So striker gear has a rocket, which is similar to a loaded Cordell, but it's a hard, heavy piece of plastic. And you don't have to load it yourself. Because I know some people who have loaded cork and cordials and have them break and have a fish break off, as opposed to the, this rocket, which is solid. All right, the integrated weight and the paddle tail, that's that. The canal bait and tackle and the fish there. Next. So, this is one. <laughs> <laughs> about seven inches long, weighs four ounces. I drilled a couple of holes in it, filled it with shot, and used hot melt glue to seal it back up. So next, now the hard plastic stripe of gear looks almost the same, weighs about the same, but um, it's one piece. It's not hollow, and you don't load it yourself. Next, this is that integrated, so this is the tail, the body, in that, that head. So we saw that other one with the head was a little thinner. This is just more of a, more of a compact piece, but it works really well. Okay. Uh, talked about the lures. These, these manufacturers got the Gibbs, happy as a clam PK. And actually, I have a friend in the audience, Hog Island, and he, he, uh, he's made a couple of lures that we've been testing and experimenting with. And, and We've got some nice fish on those lures. And so we're developing a bunch of things with those. Um, metal lip swimmers, you know, not enough canal guys use them, uh, but surf guys use them all the time. And they work in the canal too, especially in certain currents. Um, Is that a Danny or a, or a Paula? Pardon? Danny or a Danny, Danny, yeah, exactly. So a Danny, which is a great beach lure, a great a rock lure, in the canal around half an hour either side of the turn, in the middle of the night, a black Danny, and I've had fish just absolutely explode right in front of me on those lures. 
They're pretty big. They, they, they just, they work just like that. All right. Um, then there are glide baits. Mystic Road and Spellbinder. Uh, very good. Striper Gear has a stick bait. Uh, darters and Needles. Big Fish and the guy who's been making lures. He's a mass bass friend of mine. Uh, Joe Pye really is an artist with what he makes. My friend Jack Shepard makes lures and his are very reasonably priced. And Mystic Lures, uh, those are those new glide baits. All right. Colors, white, yellow, black, mackerel, pink or squid. It's about all I need. Regulation changes. May of 2020, inline circular. Because what happened was the, the striped bass population's in decline again. Uh, because it has been poor recruitment, which means not a lot of baby stripers coming. That's the recruitment. It has not been great. They have year class. 2011 was wonderful. 2015 was very good. Uh, those fish are now eight years old. The reason that they made, a, made they had that slot, 28 to under 35, was to try to get these fish to be eight years old, hit 28 inches, breed at least once before they get caught in the paper. Um, what happened was, there were so many fish from the 2015 year class, these eight-year-old fish, well, they were seven years old last year, because some of them were precocious and were growing really fast. And the take that they estimated for, for recreation, the take is estimated. Commercial, they, they know a quarter, but they estimate. And twice as many fish fell into that slot and got taken. So we basically lost a good percentage of breeders. So they changed the rule, emergency May 26 to October 26, 28, and now the slot's 28 inches to under 31 instead of 28 to under 35. And just last week, or the week before, Division of Marine Fisheries, Atlantic State Marine Fisheries met, that rule is now made, that emergency regulation is now going to run until 20, October 2024. Uh, it's been deemed very successful in uh, keeping uh, a lot more fish in the population. Mm -hmm. There is a commercial striped bass market, and they're 29 to $30 a pound. Um, you can buy them, and there is a tradition. I mean, people come to the Cape from everywhere and want to buy a fresh white bass and eat it. And so there is an 800,000 pound commercial. Now, we think that's a lot of fish, but recreational anglers take about five to ten more, catch five to ten more times of that, and then if 10% of them die, they're taking out that many fish to it. Yeah, there's a, there are whole talks that can be done on fisheries management, fisheries regulation, or as some people would say, fisheries mismanagement. But personally, I know a bunch of people involved, they're doing the best they can with the data they've got. And they set the rule in 2020, no commercial fishing in the Cape Cod Canal, because a guy could catch 235 to 4 plus inch fish on commercial days and take them out. Well, how can you tell that commercial guy who's taken out a big fish to someone who's, who is, who is limited to taking 28 to 35? And so, the, so they change. There's a lot of things with the rules. No commercial fishing in the canal. Okay. Now, this is the newest poster that they put out. And I just saw it last week, 28 to 31. This is a great poster. Why did the regulations change? Uh, the, the 2015 year class is one of the largest ever. That's 2011. Also, all those fish we're catching that are 45 inches long are from 2011. All of these fish that are third, up to about 32, 33, 34, 35 inches, those are eight year old from 2015. But the quote they took, this is the recreational harvest had been running here. In 2022, they caught that many more, so they said, we got a problem. That's why they put the emergency regs. Um, if you see these signs around, they're great, they're good reading. And you can uh, get a strike complaint, you can 
you can sign up for some of these programs where you become a citizen scientist and you can learn more about the regs. So, great poster. In 2020, they put this up. 20 to 35. Good people, they listen to that. Okay, next. And then they had, all of a sudden, these signs showed up on the canal too. No commercial fishing. And you can't have within a thousand feet of the canal. All right. Now let's get to talk about fishing a little bit. Knots. Everybody has to know knots to fish. Palomar. Catch your, your braid, which most of us fish with to a swivel. It's a palomar knot. It's extremely simple to use. And it's pretty much a no-fail knot. You should be able to tie it in, in the dark if you're a good fisherman. Double uni, lead in a line without a swivel. Um, most of us use a swivel because we're throwing a, a big leader. We're not too worried about the fish being picky. But when we're fishing for things other than striped bass, like false albacore, bonito, that are fishing with their eyes, or, or hunting with their eyes as opposed to their lateral line, they're very picky. And so you're tying lures directly to your leader. You're tying your leader directly to your braid. You're basically not showing an extra flash of metal to anybody to school them. Um, have a knot you have confidence in. Next. All right. How to fish the canal. Know how each lure works. One of the good things about having a day where you're not catching any fish is you get a chance to test all your lures. And you see how they swim, what happens in different currents. And there are certain times I'll put on a lure. I'll, I'll reel it in once and I'll say, the current's not right for this lure. And I'll just put it away and go to it and, and, and try another one. But you sort of learn how different lures work at different times. Uh, now, easiest lure to fish, when, I, when I've taken some friends out, or people will say, gee, you've got to take me fishing. I say, okay, first of all, I say, meet me at 4 a.m. That sort of weeks out a good number of people. <laughs> and I know that they, 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 they meet you when I say to meet them at 4 a.m. I know we got a good start. Uh, but, so these sand eels, what I say, just cast it out. Count to three, count to five, whatever, and then just reel. You just do this. Just cast and reel. It's all you have to do. Because some days, that's all you have to do. And that's the easiest way. Um, so then you can get fancy. Move the rod up, tip up and down a little extra. That gives it different action. Uh, vary counts. Count to three seconds, count to eight. Um, so you're fishing different parts of the water column, you don't know where the fish are. Then, more advanced, you learn how to deep jig, bounce the bottom, and you can actually feel that. that so you get a current running this way, you bounce it, and you can feel it go. And you can actually feel the rod tip doing this. And then you can feel the fish hit this. And then you set the hook. But, you get caught on muscles, muscle beds, other people's line, rocks, crap in the bottom of the pool, probably shopping carts, I don't know. But fish spend more of their time down on the bottom than anywhere else, which makes jigging effective. Next. Right. Second E, these magic squibbers with a stick chat or the glide bait, you cast. Instead of keeping your rod tip up like this, you, you, you sort of keep it at a little bit of an angle, so that, but like that, and you reel, and you sort of, you, you're just doing this. That's all you're doing. And all of a sudden, it rips the rod out of your hand. Um, so that's what you do. You might sweep it once in a while. Okay. Um, pencil poppers and surface rules. There is nothing as exciting as throwing a lure and having a 25 pound bass absolutely explode on that lure. Make a splash this big, and your rod goes down, and your drag on your reel starts to scream. That's why we're addicted. 
That's when I said about your friends who were addicted. That's why. All right. Then you cast. Put the butt right like that. And then you hold it like that. You hold it like that. You reel. And you're doing this. All right. I actually have different retrieves. I even name my retrieves. It's not that I tell anybody, but I'm saying, okay, now I'm going to do this the flame bait fish. So I'm thinking, I've got to move that a little bit quicker to make it look like it's trying to get away. Or well, I have one that's like a dime. But remember, everybody here had, ever had a goldfish in a bowl. Remember when that goldfish started to die? It would go lie on its side, it would drop down, and it would go. <laughs> that's, that is how I invented the, the, the dying bait your truth. You need to have a long day. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are the stun bait. And, they, and they're stunned because these fish aren't always just hitting the bait with their mouths. A lot of them are, are whacking the bait with their tails to stun it and then come back and eat it. So that's why you actually have to invent a, a retrieve called the stun bait fish. Um, the Lord gets hit, sometimes they don't, they, they don't get it, sometimes they're in competition, and three or four will be chased. There, there, there'll be days when the fishing's great, there'll be days when you're casting and you'll get four hits in a row before one, one hooks up on the same cast. All right, next. All right, so just so I, this is at dawn. And it's hard to see, but you see this rather, it's, that's nicely defined there. But you see this is kind of fluttery? Because I'm doing a little bit of fluttering with that. And, 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 and the tip of the rod moves different than the butt of the rod. So just give him a little bit of action. And go back one second. People say, how do you decide when it's time to, to fish a surface for? Because for some reason, I mean, typically you don't throw them when it's dark because that's not how the fish are feeding. But what I do is I take a, take a lure and I hold it up to the sky. And if I can see a good solid outline, which means the sky is now light enough, I'm pretending I'm a fish under water looking up and say, oh, I can now see the outline of that lure clearly. I can now effectively start fishing the surface. Next. Um, next. Sorry, that's okay. All right, the loaded lures, you fish like a jig, you cast it. All right, now, metal lip swims. Casting distance limit. We have this gentleman here talked exactly about the classic Dan. And that, that lure was invented by a guy, his first name was Dan. And it, it, you know, it's a legendary lure. Everybody should have one in their bag and not have fishing. Because it, it's a metal lip lure, but it doesn't die. You don't think, you think that that metal lip will make it die. No, what it does is it makes it wobble. Darters, they wobble, they have a different wobble. Needles, you know, picture taking a broomstick, cutting a piece of broomstick about seven or eight inches long, putting two hooks of hooks on it, cast it out, and then just reel it slow, and then slow down. And you have to have confidence that the fish will hit that board. But it's wicked in rock piles, along beaches, and even certain times in the canal. Just a great war with absolutely no action whatsoever. Next. Yep, feel. All right, another beautiful shot. We are blessed being fishermen to see foggy mornings where you cannot see this far in front of your face. Um, this was looking up toward the Bourne Bridge, 5.30 1 a.m. My kind of morning. Sunrise was just around 6, so at 6.17, I've got a little piece of sun, and the cloud, the, the fog, but sometimes you'll see that fog, and, then, and during the course of a couple of hours on the canal in the morning, 
That fly will roll in and roll up. When the current changes and the water's coming out of Buzzards Bay or coming out of Cape Cod Bay, depending on the temperature of the water, temperature of the air, that fog will roll one way or the other. It will clear up or it will come back. Just absolutely a lot of problem. Next. When to go? Why do I see all the cars parked along the canal? Because there were cell phones and people call all their friends when the fish show up. Um, but there are sometimes there are people that know certain days there are moon tides. We expect certain days there to be fish because the conditions are historically correct. People are there. But I say go fishing when you can. I say I like one and a half hours before sunrise to one and a half hours. I, uh, I've told my wife I just need three hours a day to pursue my passion. That's not counting naps. But I need three hours a day. And give me that every day and I'm good. Um, or two hours before the current turn, two hours after. Again, dawn breaking tides are when these two things happen at the same time. Uh, the best opportunity is twice a month. Every canal article, anybody who writes an article, or East End Eddy will write an article, or he'll give a video uh, fishing report, and everybody's saying, all right, we have dawn breaking tides coming up this week. Everybody get ready because you're going to get those situations. Um, fishermen schedule for vacation. I was fishing the other uh, last moon tide. And that new guy, he was from New Jersey, he basically scheduled his week up for the dawn breaking tides. Lo and behold, we had four days of absolute nothing. You got no fish on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And they were perfect, perfect conditions. On Friday, it made his week, and it sure made, it was an epic day. It made everybody's day. It made everybody's week. All right. There are changes happening. There's a lot of temperature due to the, whether the fish are, are the, you know, the the young of the year classes, those, those years where they're successful breeding as they get older. I joke that the fall run used to start in September, now starts the middle of August. You now, fish are looking at the, at the moon and the sun and how long the day is. Starting to think, I've got to go back off the Chesapeake Bay. I've got to go winter in North Carolina. There are no bait, there's no fish. There were less big bait in those years. More bait in 2023. 20, May, June, and July were absolutely great this year. All right. Fish seem to have shorter patterns. Used to be you have three to five days of good action. Now it's been only one or one. And then you've lost the moon or you've lost that time. But in July, there were five straight days where people were catching fish twice a day. Morning bite and an afternoon bite. So, just when you thought you had it figured out, you think you know, you have a plan, everything lines up right, shut up. It happens. All right, intelligence. We on, on the Water Magazine has fishing reports. Fisher and Magazine, Canal Report by East End Eddie, who's actually in the audience back there. Um, they get intelligence, but fish have, have <coughs> fits. Uh, Eddie also does a show on, <coughs> on TV. Um, but fish have fins, they move. Dave Perros, local guy, he was on uh, County Road. He writes for Salt and Cape, and he does the monthly Cape Cod report, the Upper Cape report, and on the water. Um, so you get some intelligence. The local tackle shops, go there, you'll get intelligence. But, they didn't say, I saw, caught these fish, you know, the fish were here on Wednesday, or they were here on Tuesday. Now I'll use that information to say, well, if they were there, they're probably moving one direction or another 
I'll sort of tweak where I go based on that intelligence because they have fits. But there's better, there's, there's, you can pick up some really good intelligence, which is, gee, white's working or yellow's working. And that might mean they're on a certain day, whether it's whiting in the spring or whether it's on mackerel or they're on squid. So those, those baits may stay around a week or two, so that intelligence has a little more lasting power than knowing where the fish were two days ago. So that helps you with lower size and color selection. Next. All right. When you go, practice casting before you go. <laughs> or go when there's no one else around. That's a good thing. Have your gear ready when you arrive. I don't know how many times I'm fishing and I see a guy come down and, and grab him. He's probably a working guy, probably has a house full of kids, but he's there to come fishing. But when he gets there, it's not that he does anything for it. He's putting on his leaders, he's putting the rod together, tying stuff up. And I will say this, and there are other people in the room who will agree, that they have caught their only fish of the day on the very first cast when they get there. So the key is, if you've got a plan and a place to go, you want to be ready when you get there. Uh, too many times I've, I've caught a fish, and it's been the last fish, because I've gotten to the bite late, and people have been catching, and I get there, and I get a chance to get one cast in, and I'll get one nice fish, and they've moved on. It's just, but be ready. Expect to fish every cast. Otherwise, you wouldn't do a couple hundred casts if you weren't expecting to catch fish. But no, if there's no guarantee you'll even catch one that day. Um, practice canal etiquette. Respect the fish. They are a wonderful resource. They are a great exercise. They get us up and rolling every day and interested in doing what we do. Respect the fish. All right, so I'm fishing with 50 of my closest friends. <laughs> but not quite 50, but that's the East End Belt. And actually, this was actually, these guys all knew what they were doing. I jumped in between, in between a couple of these guys, and we caught some nice fish. I was doing one of those blitzes in 2017 or 2018. There's not 50 guys in that picture, but there are places like, you know, you can flip it here. Check this thing. All right, hold on. But there are places like Buzzard Bay Park, the railroad bridge on the mainland side. I finally figured out the best way to describe what the, some people call it combat fishing. But, but here's, here's, the, here's the image. Picture the rock cats, Rockefeller set, where these people can put one arm on the shoulder of the next one. One arm on the shoulder of the next one, and instead of kicking, they're basically cast. Now they're synchronized pretty much, but it's like fishing with the rock hats. <laughs> All right, so do what others use for a lure type. Don't cross them up. Know the current speed and directions. The current is pretty consistent. I mean, if, it, if one minute it's going like this, the next minute it's going like this, guess what? It's going to do that the next minute too. So the guy on this side down, he throws first, then the next person, then the next person, and then the lures all travel like this, and then this guy pulls in first, and then this guy. And now if someone hooks up, they'll say fish on, and those guys below them are out of luck for a minute because that guy's got to land his fish. And you never cross across pass across something. Okay, keep going. We're in the rat. Um, everybody has a cell phone and calls their friends. Some people like to fish the combat zone or fish rockhead style. Not me, though. I fish with four or five folks who I know, and we do just fine as close as the rockets, but we feel like we all know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And trust one another. Look for vehicles, keep the fish there or avoid it. <laughs> Next, safety. Rocks are slippery, boots with studs, rubber boots that don't slip, or corkers with studs, waders of boots. Now, 
People say, well, you don't want to fall in the, the canal with waves. I don't wade in the canal. I wade them so I can sit on the weeds and get down. I want, to, I want to fish standing next to the water so when I land the fish, I can handle it. I don't want to fish from the access road, hook a really nice fish, and then have to navigate down 30 feet of slippery rocks to get that fish off my line. Uh, walking stick. Best, I, I promised Tina when I moved here that I would wear corkers and I would have a walking stick because she worried about me falling every single day. Um, nitro gloves or tape on the casting finger. A lot of people have fishing fingers. I have a thing about it. Bug spray. Places to store your glasses and your hearing aids. Mm -hmm. so, even without my hearing aids, I can hear fish when they're feeding. Just one of those things. <laughs> Water, got to hydrate. Fish grip implies what? Uh, I fish in prime time. That's at those two hours around sunrise. Uh, beauty in the dark, it's great. Be ready. Right, that's summarize what I just said. Fish other places besides the Cape Cod Canal. We have beautiful water, whether it be on Martha's Vineyard, whether it be Rhode Island, whether it be Maine, whether it be other places on the Cape. There are lots of places to catch fish. I mean, this, that's actually dawn. That's, that's, the, that's the first sun of sunrise hitting that fish. And um, that's on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, learn and experiment. Learn that even with the best or perfect conditions, you will be shut out. Uh, one thing about conditions, one of my best ever days fishing was Tropical Storm Jose. You could see the sheets of wind and rain coming across the canal, and it would stop momentarily in another sheet. I spent hours fishing doing Tropical Storm Jose, and I just caught fish every day. Yeah, you know, with the right rain here, you can do it. Go ahead. Uh, Great Canal Reads, seven miles after sundown, East End Eddy. He talks about how to catch the canal, how to fish fit the canal, and about some of the characters that are in the canal. He wrote this book before he knew me. <laughs> I met him on his book tour. Uh, Fishing the Cape Cod Canal, a surf caster's guide to strikers by D.J. Monk. Probably one of the best books written that's just dedicated to fishing the canal. Uh, all, of, all of the secrets are there, and D.J. knows his stuff. Uh, My Fishing Cape Cod, so Ryan Collins has this virtual club called My Fishing Cape Cod. He's given reports and information, trips, everything. Good stuff. Next. All right. I'm not going to go into detail. Have a canal guide. Keep going. That's what it looks like. All right. I've highlighted one day. Next. This is what that one day looks like. See these little asterisks and these two asterisks? That actually means something. Some a friend of mine told me and taught me all about that. That means the minus tide of zero to one feet. So this is from navigators. We use the canal. They need to know if it's going to be a foot shallower. Or if it's going to be two foot shallower. So you get minus tides with double asterisks. Keep going. Mm -hmm. All right, now, I had a book like this. I had this on that date. 718, I wanted to be fishing around 718. So the reality, 6.30 a.m. to 8.30, we fished in a tuck set, pole 360. Caught 46, 44, 33, and 34 inch bass. All right. Then we knew that the fish should be moving. We moved ourselves over to the radar tower. We caught 25 at 9 o'clock. We started. We caught 25 more fish as we followed that fish. Now I knew that. I wrote it in my book. But but I just based on that information there, I had that plan already put together the night before. Next, my book, my notes. Don't need a lot of notes, but you need notes. Next, go back. Uh, all right, that's me. The day I retired, 
I became virtual. I created my business card, which was my name, my email address, and my phone number, and a picture of a striped ass, because that's all I needed. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Anybody? All right. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.